but there's a video which is two minutes long, barely barely any words, and I think it explains the function of the police, especially in the United States, better than anyone could in an hour long lecture. Uh, yeah. A phenomenal <laughs> piece of footage, uh, which was shown live on Fox on Monday. Um, yeah, it shows not just the racism, but also the incompetence of U.S. cops. Let's take a look. This vehicle and those guys over there got out of the other vehicle. There's a gold store, a uh, gold store in the parking lot, and they were heading to it. And these guys came out and they said, no, you're not. Wow. And he is with us. They're, they're having a standoff here. Oh, my God. Uh, arguing about why they're not being allowed to break into the place. Here comes the cops. They're trying to flag them down. We're trying to flag down the cops. Oh. Hold on. Let me flag them back here. They're driving past us. Oh. Stop. This is one of the most surreal moments we've seen. Uh, what is underway right. right now in Van Nuys? All right, so here come the police officers They're to help to stop these some community guys members. To loot. The guys on the <laughs> other side are in cars. All right, here they come. The guys here are trying to stop over there from looting in the cars. All right, now they're telling them. No, no, they're uh, fine. They're good. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. no. Whoa. Oh, my God. Joe, Joe, to your right. Come on. He's with us. He is with us. He's with us. Sir, they're there. Okay, sir. Sir, they're the store owners. They were protecting the looters, sir. Whoa. They're, they're protecting the stores. or looters are over there. Stand down for a sec, please. Relax. You're losing your looters. We're they're taking going down that way. These are the people in the stores Which trying one? to stop. Point, point. All three of them. Okay, the, we're putting those in handcuffs right now. You do know no, they're no. not the looters. Hey, one person talk. Where's okay. the looter? Where's He's, the looter? Where's the looter? Where's they're they're help protecting this building. Hey, where'd the looter go? They were. Okay, hey, description. Uh, Black, white, Asian. African Americans are there to show you how easily and quickly things can go wrong or can be misinterpreted. Wow. Christina. This, this, yeah. is, this is one yep. of the wildest yes. things I've ever seen. Uh, and, and then to see oh, that. Oh, no, they're that, taking the woman from the car. She's not involved. She just stopped to look. Okay. I think she is with these people. And she came over to get her mom because she saw it on TV. Mm. I mean, they are so fucking dumb, right? The bit where the bit where the police, where the journalist, sorry, is trying to explain to the police officer, no, they're the people, they're the people who are protecting the shop from being looted, and the cops just sort of like, oh, don't worry, we got them, we've got them. She's like, you, you, you can't understand. You, you're not listening to what I'm saying. I mean, I'm assuming that you all followed what was going on there. I'll just, I'll just lay it out in case anyone was a bit confused by that two minutes of chaos. <laughs> um, so the, the people, I think it was their shop. They were trying to defend their shop against looters. They were trying to wave down the cops who were driving along by and getting ignored by them fundamentally. Um, ultimately, the cops do come along um, to, well, what, what the shop owners hope is to, you know, scare away the looters or whatever. Um, what they do do is they see black people in front of the shop who were the owners of the shop who were calling them down and assume they must be the looters because they're black people in front of the shop. Start arresting them. The journalist is saying they're not, you know, that's not the problem. I mean, and then it ends with them arresting the shop owner's daughter who's just driven past because she's seen the whole thing on TV. Um, I mean, oof. Fox is saying just to say that's what it seemed to me because I can't get that, that that's what it looked like to me but I don't think there was much ambiguity there and you also have to think that if if those journalists hadn't been there yeah then all, all of them you know the owners of the shop her daughter they could all quite easily have ended up in jail right or dead because they like to shoot people you know um and that's that's the thing is that that's what happens right like this is what happened in many of these police killings that people are protesting is they burst into people's houses you know on a drug raid or something else like that and they literally shoot whoever is there who vaguely looks like they might have been the suspect which basically just means they're also black and that you know that, that kills hundreds of people a year, it just being the wrong person. And right now with them super amped up, with them having all of these weapons out now, you know, people are getting shot with rubber bullets, with tear gas. Um, it's just a recipe for, you know, that that scene is kind of funny, right? We can laugh at that a little bit, but like 
that woman could have just gotten shot right on camera and we would all be watching that instead. And it's, you know, it's terrifying. And we can joke about like, they can't even protect properly well, property well, but like they, you know, they, that's, that's a bunch of people who are pointing guns at that woman. And if one of them felt threatened for just a second, he could have just pulled the trigger. Mm. And he yeah. would have got off probably. Dahlia, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I, and it's that combination of total impunity mm -hmm. and obviously the, um, the racism that underpins the distribution of property in the US. Um, and the fact, but I also think that this kind of, um, I don't want to say indiscriminate because obviously it is very discriminatory, but this kind of sense that if you exist in particular communities, if you exist in particular bodies, you are kind of always at the risk of that kind of, as you said, you know, the police bursting into your home mm -hmm. and being able to do whatever it is that they want to do to you or can do to you and being acquitted. And that comes back to this question of when, like how the, the, the institution of policing, once it is able to designate particular communities as suspicious or as pre-criminal is a term that is actually used in the UK policing system. Um, literally someone who is, who is not, might not be a quote unquote criminal now, but will be a criminal eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and once you have been unfortunate enough to fall on the wrong side of that, the state is able to use any means of violence against you. And that is what, that is consistently the defense that is used mm -hmm. in order to let cops off the hook. It's, they say they felt under threat, their mm -hmm. job is so hard. And that's how they appeal, I think, a lot to a lot of middle, um, middle class Americans is, you know, wouldn't you be so scared if you had to spend so much time in these communities and with these mm -hmm. people? You know, of course they, um, some, you know, feel threatened by um, a man sleeping in his car, et cetera, et cetera. So um, ag again, there is that question of, yes, this looks like a kind of comical or indeed indiscriminate um, situation, but actually that kind of unpredictability and constant precarity is part of the disciplining function mm -hmm. of policing. Right. Right. When we talk about Breonna Taylor, who was one of the other people killed recently that the protests have been, um, you know, lifting up, she was killed in her house by police who were serving a warrant. And she was not the person who was a subject of the warrant. She was, I just looked this up to actually make sure I got this right. She had, they had like heard some rumor that one of the people they were trying to find was selling drugs and had used her address for a delivery at some point. And for that, she was killed in her own home. And so that, right, that sort of tension, that sort of fear. Um, the interesting thing about these sort of citywide curfews is they are weirdly generalizing that fear in a way that a lot of people who look more like me have never really experienced. Like suddenly, you know, I live in West Philly, which is a historically black neighborhood. I am closer to the university. And so it's um, a little bit more upscale where I am, um, but it's not a really clear line. It's sort of, you know, and so the people in my neighborhood um, are now being policed the way they would be if they looked differently and lived three blocks the other way. And that kind of experience is sort of like the experience that a lot of young people had in the student movement in the UK and in the Occupy movement in the US, it's where you have sort of white middle class raised people experiencing violent policing for the first time, it really changes how you look at the world, I think, right? I think that's going to be my final question for you, actually, Sarah, which is, yeah. are, are the police really playing with fire here? The fact that, you know, their behavior, one is getting filmed and, and spread widely on, on social media. Yeah. The other that they're imposing these curfews, which are indiscriminate, and normally the effect of police violence is concentrated on, on black people. So they think, well, they're not in our voting group anyway. Yeah. Um, and then also they're doing completely weird things like just shooting at journalists, like could could we be approaching a bit of a perfect storm where after decades of of you know a complete inability to reform the police have no choice but to shift to some degree how they do their jobs the one other thing that i would add to that is that we're about to have a ton of state budget mm -hmm. fights because the coronavirus cr economic crisis right and the states can't run a deficit like the federal government can so the states are going to have to look for places they can cut and suddenly the you know the people who have already been organizing on the ground for a long time demanding cuts to the police budget 
suddenly those people are walking in saying, hi, have you seen what they were doing? Because I watched it on the nightly news. Suddenly you've got, you know, again, your average middle class white person is suddenly sharing on Instagram the place where you can call in and demand that the, you know, New York City cut the NYPD's $6 billion budget. And that's going to be a really, really interesting set of political fights right now. And this brings back to the union question also, I think, because um, teachers unions, among others, have started making these demands already. Um, I think I sent to you before, Michael, the, the Minneapolis police department, uh, excuse me, Minneapolis schools remove, um, ending their contract with the police department to get the police out of Minneapolis public schools. Um, Peter Freyes, who is also a friend of Navarra's, I think, um, went to public school in Minneapolis and posted about like, going on a protest against those cops in schools in high school, and they're finally, finally gonna be out of the schools. So when we think about like the amount of time people have been making demands about cutting funding, getting policing out of these communities, getting policing out of the schools, we're seeing things move already. And I think we're gonna see a lot more pressure and a lot more struggle around this in the months, year or so to come. 